Welcome back, everybody, to Getting In, a College Coach Conversation. We're doing listener questions today. And as is so often the case, my colleague Shannon Vasconcellos is joining me for these. Shannon not only works with me here, but is also a former financial aid officer at both Boston University and Tufts University. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Beth. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. It feels like it's been a long time since we did these, and it's probably been literally like, I don't know, four weeks. Probably. Probably. <laughs> anyway, I just want a shout out for both Shannon and me in that this is the first time in a year and a half, I may be, maybe even longer than that, truly, that I am taping this podcast from my home and nobody else is home. Yay. And Shannon, your two young children are at school. They are at school. Yay. Exactly. Just started back this week. It's very exciting. I was telling you before the show. I still have the husband home with me. I haven't removed all distractions, but it's gotten a lot better. But it's gotten better. So that's good. And presumably he needs a little bit less attention than your kids do, but marginally, yes. Marginally. Okay. So well, you've dimed him out. You've done it all yourself. I don't have to feel bad here. Uh, and if you think you've tuned into the marriage counseling show, <laughs> well, you're right. You may well, you may be right. You may be right. <laughs> All right, so um, we do have questions today, although I would say um, to our listeners, we'll take more. Um, we would love your questions. You can post them on LinkedIn. You could post them on Instagram. You can post them on our Facebook page. You could private message us uh, them to us on any of those platforms. You can email them to us at ooh, gettingin at gmail.com. I have a feeling, hold on. Let me go. I know I have this email I always address forget here. it. It's, I do too. It's not quite right. <laughs> getting in dot voiceamerica at gmail.com. I don't know why it has to be so long, but it is getting in dot voiceamerica at gmail.com. This is why just follow us on Instagram and then you can shoot us the question. It's super easy that way. Um, before we jump into the questions, I actually, um, this is the time of year, September, where I think that college admissions stress uh, emerges in a way that is probably at its most intense level for September and October and a little bit in November and December. But for these two months, things get a little crazy. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to share an, a story about something and use it as a way to talk a little bit more about what pa parents and students sometimes think colleges are doing and what really they are doing. Um, so I'm working with a student who um, applied to college last year, applied to probably a much larger list than he normally would have. And the reason for that was it was really based on the pandemic. He hadn't been able to visit any schools. And um, we tried really hard to get the list narrowed down and to be more focused, but he just couldn't do it. And the end results, I think, A, showed a little bit from uh, they didn't turn out that well. And one of the reasons was definitely, I think, that the list was too big. Um, but the other reason, too, was simply that it was a crazy year. And so some schools that we really felt probably could have turned out that he could have gotten into, it didn't happen. And so what he wound up doing is turning down his offers and he's going to be reapplying to a much smaller group. Uh, and he's also going to be doing early decision, which he could not do last year for a few different reasons. One of them being he hadn't visited anywhere, right? So you never want to commit. And since that time, he's been able to go back and visit some schools and see them firsthand. And one has really emerged as a favorite. And his dad thought it would be a great idea for him to reach out to his admissions officer to essentially provide an update because he did apply to this school last year. He was waitlisted. And to say, you know, hey, I'm going to be applying in the early decision round and um, I just wanted to let you know. And in this situation, the dad and I had a conversation about what I thought was appropriate and what dad was wanting him to do. And they were mm -hmm. two different things. And but what emerged from the conversation was dad's concern that the school understand that this was a serious application and it wasn't just well, you know, COVID and, you know, I I just, you know, I'm, I've decided I'm going to apply. And, you know, my take was that colleges are not spending, when you're reading a file as an admissions officer, you're not spending a lot of time trying to dig into 
what this what is this student applying early decision really mean you know what you think it really means they really want to go to your school yep. <laughs> right <laughs> and so like we you're not sitting there thinking well they're in the early decision pool because of what happened last year and it's not a very thoughtful choice it's just a nobody has time for that you are, you need to get through a stack of files or on this case you know these files on your computer and you're mostly taking the application at face value and so what i really was encouraging the students to do is really pour all that energy and effort stop worrying about what the admissions officer is going to add to what they think about your mindset and instead use that energy to do well on the application. Give it your best effort, right? Same thing when it comes to, well, the school is test optional, but what will they think when I don't submit scores? They'll think you chose to use the test optional option. They're not gonna spend a ton of time thinking, and, and I think the key here is, marking them like giving you points against your acceptance because you chose not to submit scores it's simply a piece of the application that isn't there for them to consider they're not going to be can say well they must not have done well on those and therefore this is somehow yeah. a less than application um it, it's very possible the student didn't take the test even if they came from a well-to-do area where everybody takes the test even if the test was available the school is test optional. If you didn't take the test or you didn't do well enough that your score is not gonna be helpful to you, then don't submit it and don't worry about the rest of it. Um, yeah. so, you know, so I think the, my general message is don't, don't spend a lot of time focusing on what you think the college admissions officers are gonna infer from choices. And I was curious if there was any finance side, similar thing that, that might occur to you when I tell this story. Yeah, I, the, what I could think of is people who've, they may have, you know, made a good amount of money in one year on the financial aid application, and they're convinced that the financial aid office thinks they've always made so much money, but really they just got, you know, a promotion right. four years ago, and but they've spent the first, you know, 13 years of their child's life making very little money. The, same as with the admissions officers, they're really not thinking this hard. They're looking at the information right. in front of them, making a decision based on that information. The only way that I think it might be a little different, though maybe not all that different, the thing that comes to mind is if a financial aid officer does notice what is legally known in the financial yes. aid world is conflicting information mm -hmm. they are required if they award any federal student aid to resolve any conflicting information so if they see two pieces of information on a financial aid application that don't jive they are required to figure out what's going on there so an example would be you put two different amounts of money uh, on the fafsa and on the profile form mm -hmm. if they see that they need to resolve that somehow they need to figure out what money you actually have um, some colleges would consider the fact that you may be reported having zero money in the bank but they might have requested a tax return where they see you earned thousands of dollars in interest income that mm -hmm. may on the surface be conflicting information because how did you earn thousands of dollars in interest income if you didn't if you have no money in the bank on the right. surface there's a conflict there that the financial aid office has to resolve though frankly that would only be noticed at kind of the um richest more selective private schools that have the staff to look into these things frankly at most um, universities even that would not really go they're not requesting tax returns and that would honestly go unnoticed so yeah for the most part very short amount of time with admissions applications and with financial aid applications to get through a whole bunch of them they're not psychoanalyzing you they're not delving deep into your history they're just looking at the information in front of them making a decision based on that right and well and just to make sure that i'm understanding this correctly too if they see conflicting information and they are required to resolve it they don't make up what they think is the resolution <laughs> they actually 
look for the res right they look Correct. for the data they might <laughs> ask you why are these two things conflicting they're not going to say well i think what probably happened here is they're lying or what happened must yes. it must be this you're exactly going to actually right. they find will out. ask for yes. documentation so if you reported two different incomes let's see the w2 to see your actual income or right. in the case with the assets not matching up with the interest income either show me you know show me a bank statement that shows that you have zero money in the bank or um tell me did you just make a mistake there or maybe there is a very legitimate reason i had a bunch of money in the bank and i just bought a house and now mm -hmm. all that money is gone great just show Perfect. me you know the purchase and sale and we are done here fabulous we're not going to make assumptions that you're lying we are going to find what try to find what is the accurate information and then we can proceed nobody wants to hold up a financial aid application right. we we want everything to match up perfectly because we've got you know a pile uh, you know 100 right. stack papers high that we're trying to get through so we're not looking to to hold up anyone's application um we just are legally required to find the accurate information so occasionally there's a conflict most of the time um it's sort of just stamp of approval and we move on. Perfect. Okay. Let's jump into questions now. We have one two, that comes to us from Tiffany and this is for you. Uh, I love these questions that start with, I've heard that if you are a listener <laughs> to this podcast, you know that my immediate reaction when someone starts with, I've heard that is you should from there on be prepared to hear a myth, a half truth, yeah. something that's not right. So anyway, Tiffany says, I've heard that the FAFSA is going to be changing in the future. Actually, that's true. Look at that. I think is right. <laughs> that's right. When is that happening and what can we expect? Yeah, so Tiffany is absolutely right that what happened was um, one of the COVID relief bills that passed actually back at the end of 2020 included in this a big old section um, called FAFSA simplification that is scheduled to change the FAFSA. In that bill, it was actually scheduled to, the change was scheduled to take place for the 23-24 school year. Um, the Department of Education has since said, we will not be able to make these changes on time. And it has been postponed to the 24-25 school year. So we still have a few years to go before any changes take place. Um, but it really, the good part of the change is that the, based on the title of the of the bill, <laughs> you may surmise the FAFSA is being simplified. It is being greatly reduced from the current 108 questions to only 36 questions, I believe it is on the FAFSA. Hmm. So that is a wonderful thing for students and families. It will make the FAFSA much, much easier to complete. It will, should not be such a stressful process. Um, among the questions that are leaving, One's about selective service um, uh, registration, um, drug convictions, those are going away. Those won't affect financial aid anymore. Um, questions about untaxed income. Uh, I've had a number of conversations about this. Uh, if you have a grandparent or non-custodial parent paying for college that shows up as student untaxed income, those questions are going away. That will mm -hmm. no longer affect um, at least federal financial aid eligibility. Um, some less good <laughs> changes. Yeah. Uh, at least for some folks um, who is considered a, the custodial parent is going to change. It has been the parent that you live with the most. It's going to be the parent who provides more support, but we're still awaiting details on how exactly that's going to be interpreted. Um, exclusions for small businesses, small family owned businesses. You didn't used to have to report their value. You will have to report their value. They're not being excluded anymore. And the one that has is most upsetting, I think, to most yeah. people is the splitting of the expected family contribution between among all enrolled children in the family is going away. So um, currently, you know, if your parents are expected to contribute $30,000 towards college and they have two kids in college, that becomes an <clears throat> EFC of $15,000 a piece, opens up more financial aid eligibility for each child uh, under the new system that expected family contribution, with the, they're also changing the name of that to student aid index, um, that contribution is not being split anymore. So that $30,000 contribution will be $30,000 for child A and $30,000 for child B. So you may end up having to pay double if you have two kids in college at the same time than you would have under the old system. Um, right. 
parents very upset about this, understandably. I have two kids <laughs> myself. I'll be in <laughs> right. the same situation. I'm not thrilled with it. Um, but the one thing I will say is that they are still going to ask on the FAFSA how many kids you have in college. It will, the number will not be taken into account for federal financial aid purposes. However, colleges are allowed to do whatever they want in determining eligibility for their own institutional financial aid, the money from the college itself. And it really remains to be seen how colleges are going to adapt this change to their institutional aid or not. Um, I, I can definitely see it sort of going both ways. College is saying, oh, it'll save me money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to split that EFC. On the other hand, if I'm, you know, college one and I'm chosen not to split the EFC, so my college is more expensive to people and college two down the street decides they will continue to split the EFC, that college becomes a better deal. College one is going to lose students to college two. So there'll be a competitive pressure there that might get colleges to keep the, the, the um, adjustment for number in college. So that remains to be seen. But that is certainly one uh, change in terms of FAFSA simplification that folks are not thr thrilled with, unfortunately. Right, right. And I'll just throw out there that the reason, the idea behind this is that fairness, right? So if you had two right. kids that were four years apart, they were never going to be in school at the same time you were going to ultimately pay 30,000 for each kid. Yes. So the fact that you had them closer together was getting you a discount. Is that fair? Is that not fair? I have one kid. I have no horse in this race. I see <laughs> both perspectives. Yeah. Is you know what I can say there. All right, Shannon, we're going to take a really quick break and when we come back, we're going to go to more of these questions. So don't go away. 